Welcome to the Community Partners Working Together to Optimize Hospice Use Conference Call. My name is Anna, and I will be your operator for today's call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. Later, we will conduct a question and answer session. Please note that this conference is being recorded. I will now turn the call over to Janelle Shearer. Janelle, you may begin. Thanks, Anna. Hi, everyone. My name is Janelle Shearer, and I'm a program manager at Stratus Health, which is in Minnesota. And Stratus Health is part of the Lake Superior Quality Innovation Network, which includes Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Michigan. This webinar is sponsored by a group called the Grade 8, which is a group of quality innovation networks across the country, and it involves about 20 states. The presentation today is about a CMS-funded special innovation project. I will start out the presentation, and then I will turn it over to my colleagues here with me in the room. And I'll give brief introductions just so you're familiar with who they are, and I'll introduce them in order that they're going to be talking. So first, after I start out, will be Sue Cliff. And Sue is an RN, uh, CHPN. She is the supervisor of hospice and palliative care of hospice of Douglas County. And then Terry Anderson is also an RN. She's a home care hospice manager at Glacial Ridge Health System. And Mary Peterson is the director of community relations at Knute Nelson. All three hospice programs were involved in this project with Stratus Health. So the objectives for our session today are to talk about the myths regarding hospice services, to describe a community-based approach to improve the appropriate use of hospice care, and then to identify strategies to promote the goals of care discussions when there is a serious problem. So just a little bit about hospice um, philosophy before we get into the program, the project about this. So hospice is based on a philosophy that has six main concepts. The first one is that death is considered a natural part of life. So when, hosp when death is going to happen, hospice neither tries to fix it or make it uh, postpone it, make it last longer. The hospice care establishes that pain and symptom control are an appropriate goal, and that's a major focus of hospice care. And then it also recognizes that there's more to death than the physical experience, but it's also spiritual and emotional as well. Also, in the hospice philosophy, patients and families are the unit of care, so the care is not provided just to the person enrolled in hospice, but the whole family is considered uh, as a part of that care. Breathing care is very important for hospice, so after a person dies, there is support for that family for a period of time after the person has passed away. And then hospice care is made available uh, regardless of ability to pay. So who qualifies for hospice? When we think of hospice in this country, we're really thinking um, a lot about the Medicare benefit or insurance coverage. And for us here uh, in the U.S., uh, the Medicare benefit covers a person when their life expectancy is six months or less. So if the disease continues, it's normal progression. Uh, the physician would feel that they would have six months or less to live. And it's for persons of any age, any diagnosis. Now, there might be some differences in state payments. So, for example, in Minnesota, our medical assistance program, the prognosis can be 12 months or less. And that's also for people seeking comfort or palliative care rather than curative treatment. So we've learned a lot about some myths that our communities have had related to hospice, and we'll just talk about some of these myths and try to dispel them, and you may be aware of some other myths as well. So the first one is, uh, I have to give up my primary position upon hospice enrollment. Well, that is not true. Hospice really wants patients to keep their primary or usual physicians. And in fact, hospice programs are encouraged to keep communication up with the person's primary physician. The second myth is that all my medications and treatments will be discontinued. Well, the reality is that hospice programs, along with um, the primary physician, they review all medications, and medications related to the terminal illness are paid for and provided by the hospice program. Third one is I have to pay for hospice out of my own pocket. Uh, for those that need hospice, the Medicare insurance plans have a real nice benefit. It's covered 100% by Part A without a copay or deductible, and most health plans follow the same. Uh, 
okay, another myth is if I enroll in hospice, I will die sooner. Um, many of you may have heard on the media, we hear famous people that, that pass away and they say they were in hospice three days and then they pass away. So people have an understanding that if I sign up for hospice, I'm going to die sooner. And the reality is that there have been st some studies sh that have shown that certain diagnoses, uh, there were five diagnoses of cancer and conventional heart failure, that showed that the people that were enrolled in hospice actually lived longer than their counterparts with the same diagnosis that weren't in hospice. And there are some other myths that we've heard as well. You may also be aware of that, and feel free to put them in the chat if you'd like to, but other myths are that I have to be a DNR to be in hospice, or I can't refer anybody to hospice unless my patient has already agreed to be a DNR. That's a myth. 24-hour uh, coverage, where hospice will just come to your home and, and move in with you. That's another myth, that hospice is not a 24-hour coverage. So if you have other ideas, go ahead, uh, any other myths that you've heard of or are familiar with, go ahead and put them in the chat and people can, can read about them. We just listed some of the top ones that we're familiar with our communities here. Let me go back one here. So we've talked about the hospice benefit being a, a great benefit. The problem is it's greatly underutilized. And the median length of stay in hospice, and this is national data from the National Hospice and Palliative Care Organization, was 18.6 days in 2013. These next two statistics are very staggering. 30% of Medicare beneficiaries who died were in hospice for three days or less. 35 to 40% of people enrolled in hospice died in seven days or less. So when you think of the wonderful benefit that hospice is and how it can really help a patient and their family at the end of life, and when so many are using it less, uh, we feel like that's a problem and that's an issue. When we looked at the data in Minnesota, we found that we were a fairly low utilizer of hospice. So if you put the use of hospice in a quartile, Minnesota was in the third quartile of use. Now I want to just talk a little bit about this project. I mentioned before that it was a special innovations project funded by the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Uh, so CMS, and CMS had asked the quality improvement organizations to submit proposals for innovative projects. And so we had looked at our hospice data showing that Minnesota was an underutilizer and put in a proposal to, to do a project to help increase the use of hospice. This project was just a 12-month project, and it went from August uh, of 2014 excuse me, 2013 through July of 2014. So the goal of the project was to optimize hospice use. And how we would know that would be that there would be an increase in appropriate referrals to hospice and an increase in length of stay of hospice, so how long people were actually in the program. And how was that forming multidisciplinary community-based teams to implement the strategies to address barriers to optimal hospice use in that community. So the slide you're looking at here, it took hospice index on there. For Stratus Health to identify who in Minnesota had opportunities to increase their hospice use, we did what was called the hotspot technology. You may have heard of this. It was originally developed in the East Coast, uh, in the, the crime scene area. They looked at, uh, at the zip code level, different areas that had higher crimes and then they uh, implemented some strategies to help prevent the crime. There were also was a physician, an ED physician in Camden, New Jersey, who took the same technology looking at, we call them the frequent flyers to the emergency department, and noticed that they came from certain uh, high rises, so then they implemented strategies in those high rises. So we took that same type of technology and applied it to use of hospice. So at the zip code level, we looked at things like what would people more likely be using hospice for? So we looked at readmission rates for diseases such as cancer, heart failure, COPD, dementia, those types of diagnoses. We also looked at hospice use and like to stay at each zip code. And then we also looked at the age of the population. So if a population was older, they'd be more likely to use hospice. So looking at this map, the lighter the color shows more opportunity. And then 
obviously the darker the color is, there is more use of hospice. So, uh, and then the red dots are the Medicare certified hospices in our state. So we, we wanted to select hospice programs that had opportunities. You can see we were able to select three hospice communities or three communities for this program. And there were a total of seven hospice programs in this project in three communities. So we approached the hospice programs first, and then we asked them to identify community partners that would be interested. So each community identified folks from hospitals, clinics, nursing homes, assisted living, public health, there were parish nurses, nurses, uh, area agency and aging, just a variety of folks that were interested in hospice. Uh, they uh, got the group together. We had two workshops where they talked about barriers uh, to hospice use in their community. This project used it used community guided strategies. And what these included were information that was gathered from people in the actual communities to find out what do you think about hospice? What do you know about it? Would you use it if you had a serious illness? What are the barriers for using hospice? So conversations were held with uh, providers such as physicians, folks that worked at nursing homes or hospitals, clinics, uh, also with patients and families of hospice, and then just the general public, people in the community, lay people. So all the strategies were built around what we found the issues were in the community. So provider and facility education was provided, and then patient and provider resources were developed, and we'll be sharing these with you as the presentation progresses. So the next section is about the community assessment and plan, and I'll have to just take over from here. Thanks, Janelle. Um, again, I'm Sue Chris. I'm the supervisor of Hatches of Douglas County. It's a rural county in um, part of Minnesota that you'll see on the map here. And um, I've been in hospice for a long, long time, 25 years, worked as a nurse in hospice, have seen lots of patients, and met with hundreds and hundreds of families, and am excited to be able to share this project. I think in working in hospice, you would wonder why the days are so short, um, that, we, that patients are only using hospice for three days, when the benefit is so great that, that we're able to provide the patients. I don't think in all the time I've cared for patients I've ever heard ever where a patient said, I wish I hadn't signed on so soon. Um, most often what we hear is, I wish I'd known about hospice sooner. And so to be able to be a part of this project, as you can see, Alexandria, um, we're about 140 miles west of the Twin Cities, northwest, um, really. Um, but so as you can see, you know, we needed to do something to be able to get the message across to patients and families and providers that we've been doing that a long time. Like I said, I've been there and worked in hospice for 25 years. People have said, um, well, how do you talk? told the community, have you talked to the physicians? And we really have, but we needed a new way to, to talk about hospice, and that's part of what came out of this project. So what we did in the beginning was meeting with other people in our community. I think what has, what has happened with hospice is we in hospice try to decide how we should go about getting people to understand about hospice. What this project gave us was the opportunity to hear from people in the community, other providers, to hear from them how they needed to hear and what they needed to hear about hospice. And that was truly the, the starting point that, that led us to where we ended up with this um, information that we're bringing you today. It was an important part of the project. Community members and, and providers were happy to be together with us, and we got a lot of great ideas from the people that came together in this meeting. So we had structured Congress. Uh, so then um, once we met one time, then we were given homework, which everyone just loves when they leave a meeting, is to come out of there with homework. But what we were told to do is to call and do some surveys. And we did surveys with um, patients that we had cared for, actually their families, we called providers, and we called just members of the community and asked them about, um, you know, what they knew of hospice, what were some of the things that they had questions about. And what came out of it was 
almost all of the community members, residents, um, said that if they um, thought they needed hospice, if their doctor thought they needed hospice, that um, the doctor would talk to them about that. And what the healthcare professor believed was that patients were in denial and their lack of acceptance made it such that they weren't ready to have the conversation. So even if the physician knew that that conversation was probably about time to have to have with that, that patient and that family about their serious illness, about the fact that they might be um, getting to the point of hospice being appropriate, both, either both sides were waiting for the other to have that conversation first. And that was the true barrier that we discovered with all of our interviews with, with um, our community. So what we needed to do was take a different approach. You know, what we found that is if you do what you've always done, you're going to get what you have always gotten. And, and that's an important way to look at the way we were presenting hospice. And when you look at these materials, materials that Terry's going to be sharing with you lately, later, they are not hospice brochures. They are not information about hospice. They're information about end of life. And that's the important part of what we need to be talking about. We needed to take a different approach. Um, and I think we need to look at how do our patients even know what questions to ask. They don't know um, what what was shocking in some of our presentations was patients or, and community members and even providers were surprised to hear that congestive heart failure is a terminal diagnosis. And um, average life expectancy, even though it might be five or six years, it's still going to be a terminal diagnosis at some point. And that needs to be talked about with the patient and family. They don't know that unless they're told that. I think sometimes we're giving, um, we're not giving patients all the choices. And oftentimes in healthcare, we give choices for treatment and aggressive um, treatment of disease. But we don't often list comfort and the, the focus on comfort as even an option in care. People can't choose the option of comfort if they're not given the option to choose. They need to be, they have that laid out for them. As, as something that might be a way that they want the focus of their care to be. And that's truly the difference in hospice is that change in um, the focus of care. And one of the surprising gaps that we have discovered is that um, physicians over prog prog prognosticate by 500%. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that, that's huge when you're looking at uh, if they are going to be determining when hospice should be um, a part of care. Uh, and I think if they are over, you know, they think patients are going to live a lot longer and they're looking at three to six months, they're really making that referral at the very, very last few days of life. Um, and that's what leads to that median length of stay. Hospice is 18.6 days. Um, you know, that, that's a struggle. It's really hard for those of us in hospice, providing all the care and services that we do, to do all that work in three days or a week or 14 days, and that's oftentimes what we see. There's a lot of work to be done at end of life to get that patient comfortable, to get that family ready, and we need more time. So what we did when we talked to physicians was not to ask about prognosis, was more to ask about would I be surprised if I saw my patient's name in the obituary column of the local newspaper? And that really seemed to strike the physicians that I was with when we did this. Um, they really thought about that, and I'm sure that probably all of them had that experience at some point where they were not surprised that that patient had died and would it have been appropriate to think about that sooner so that that patient could have benefited from hospice services. You know, having been a hospice nurse for so many years, I think I'm an expert at reading obituaries. It is part of my pastime. And I see a lot of very elderly people having died in the hospital, and I often wonder if that's what they cho chose. You know, if that, if that 
had been a discussion with them, would that have been what they wanted? Um, and I think we need to take or really take a strong look at that so that we're offering patients the choice that, you know, they don't have to die in the hospital. They can die where they're at and, and die comfortably. Um, so this is where we think having the talk is important. Um, and I think community health programs are really good at this. That is what we do day after day. We're good at having that conversation. And so um, that's a part of what we can help with and part of what the message that we're trying to get across to people. <coughs> Hi, I'm Terry Anderson, and I'm the hospice manager at, in Glenwood, Minnesota. And, you know, as we were going through our program here, the TRUE program, we did a lot of surveying of people, and some of the gaps that we found um, to have discussed a little bit, but, you know, even talking with people and doctors, it, there was this overwhelming sense that, you know, if people do really want to talk about it, doctors would surely be willing to have that discussion with their with their patients if they ask to talk about it, and patients are kind of waiting for the doctor to start talking about it first, but if nobody brings it up, then it doesn't get talked about at all. So starting that conversation is the really difficult part of it. So here's the problem list, and the doctors and the patients are each waiting for each other to start, and sometimes the, the conversations don't happen at all, Sometimes they happen when things are really in a crisis and now you've got to make decisions having not really thought about what you wanted to do. And a couple other things are, like you said, the decision gets made so close to death that there's not that much value obtained from the hospice program when they could have been on for a long time. Or worst case scenario that we hear is having a doctor say there's nothing more we can do and we kind of beg to differ with that because hospice is the more that could have been done. So some of the gaps result from the, the provider's interpretation, and, and we don't want to put doctors in a bad light at all. We're not saying that. We're just saying, you know, we as professionals, we've operated a certain way, and we're just trying to find out where some of the um, burdens are that we're making for this communication process. So um, sometimes not all physicians are aware of what the exact benefits are or when they can initiate them. Um, sometimes the treatment goals between oncology and a primary physician or whoever else is involved in the care are, we kind of work like in silos, you know, we don't kind of connect back and forth on them, keep the patient involved in that conversation as well. So more ways to interfere with that. And another opportunity um, to have that talk sooner is to make sure that there's some material to get things started, you know, developing um, something that helps both the patient know what it's okay for them to ask and um, providing tools for our physicians and other providers on um, how they can get that that talk started. In some of our other projects we do, we call them sentence starters or scripting or, you know, and probably like you squeezed into this little, here's your script, this is what you're going to say. But, you know, when physicians are talking about there's nothing more that they can do, you know, some kind of things that can be said are, you know, I'm sorry that we can't cure your disease, but we can work together to keep you comfortable and focus on your goals and honor your wishes and support a a goal for quality of life. So that's doing something. That's not doing nothing. So that in that process of encouraging patients to ask their doctors about illnesses, we um, developed a brochure. Um, you'll be able to find that on the website as well. And um, it, it helps them to know what questions to ask because, as it's probably been said before, if they don't know what questions to ask, they don't ask the questions. And um, in our professional community, we're a lot more learned about what the questions should be, but patients don't always know that. So, and for physicians, um, they also need some information on getting that talk started. And there's also that's also on the website some tools to use for that. Our true goal was to empower the patient through shared information and options to make a choice that matches their goal and to help physicians approach that topic. 
So um, you'll see on the uh, PowerPoint there is a copy of the actual brochure, and um, on the next slide is an enlargement of that middle part that we want to read through on the second part of the brochure, and this is the list of questions that for people to ask is, um, do I have a serious life-limiting illness? Can my illness be cured? If my illness can't be cured, are there treatments that can slow down my illness? What kind of care is available to focus on making me more comfortable? If my illness keeps getting worse, then is it a good time to think about getting supportive and comfort-focused care? And will you be there, the one to tell me when it's time to contact hospice? And this one's really important for a lot of people, including the doctors. Will you stay involved with my care, even when I'm no longer looking for treatment for my disease? Because we hear that they kind of don't get kept included after they get on to hospice. So in this brochure, a lot of effort was made to not say hospice a lot. And in fact, I believe it's only mentioned once in the entire brochure because truly it is not a hospice brochure. It's a tool. It's a tool to help people talk about what their wishes and goals are and to help them get that conversation started. We've actually used that brochure in other settings where we had family members coming in, you know, at their wit's end, knowing that it was time for mom or dad to quit doing a treatment and they don't know how to get it started, and we hand them a brochure, and they've got something to go talk to mom and dad about, too. So for providers, yes, and, we, and also, um, I'm being pointed out here, we have these wonderful little pocket cards. They, they like to coin the phrase little cuties. So they kind of, uh, they're really tiny little pieces of that, just that middle section of the brochure with those main questions on there. So for, for our providers, just having those tools available um, was really important, and then we, we did training with our physicians and everything, too, to let them know that we were putting these tools up there, so when they started bringing them into the doctor's office going, here's a bunch of questions I had to ask you, at least they were kind of aware that they might be coming, so, and there's provider resources beyond just a brochure, there's like a whole, several other resources for the providers as well, so. So the shared decision-making part of this is that the, we as, as professionals, the physicians and such, have the responsibility to keep our patients informed and let them know what their options are. And the, the patient's responsibility is to choose what they want to do. And so they don't have to say, we've all heard this a few times, well, if I... If I go on hospice, I'm just giving up. And we don't want them to feel like hospice is giving up because saying that word hospice doesn't change the prognosis at all. Their prognosis will stay the same. But if they choose hospice, it provides extra care for them during their journey and they get to have that added quality and um, hospice can be involved in, in the discussions. From the very beginning, the doctors can offer to bring us in because like Sue said, we're not afraid at all to have that discussion, and, and we'd be willing to help to get it started. Thank you, Terry. And now uh, Mary Peterson will talk about the communities implementing this project. Okay, so with the initiative, we, we've gone through how we created um, the tools that we are putting out there for people to use. And now I just want to talk about how we then implemented it and pushed it out into our community. So after having some conversations, we decided that we wanted to take it out to multiple different settings and to multiple different disciplines. So on the slide there, it shows all the different places we went. The hospice programs went out to our assisted living facilities, to clinics, to home care agencies, hospitals, public health. Um, we also went and visited with administrators, nurses, discharge planners, all of the people who are kind of making decisions on kind of the next step for care. And we wanted to be able to reach out to everyone who could be involved in somebody's decision to either, you know, start a hospice service or maybe that wasn't what they wanted to and maybe they wanted to start something else. But we wanted to include everybody who would be in that conversation um, together at the table. So what we did is we reached out to those local organizations here, and we went out and did community presentations for them. Um, we talked about um, the tools that we just showed you. We also talked about, you know, the myths of hospice and, and the language, 
how the language itself can be a barrier. We were able to reach out to over um, 800 people throughout all the different conversations and presentations that we had. We did over 34 presentations. Um, at the time that we did this presentation, it's probably many more by now because um, we keep doing these. So um, I think it's amazing to look at the reach that we've had um, with just a small community, you know, three agencies that have worked together to um, try to do more in our community in regards to hospice. So as we um, reached out to uh, the providers in the area, we then wanted to reach out to the community itself. We wanted to be able to go to, um, to health fairs and to have conversations with patients and to provide tools for um, just regular people in the community to be able to have these conversations. We pushed out the information through social media. We were able to distribute over a thousand different, um, we distributed over a thousand brochures and those wallet cards that you guys just were able to see. And we were able to have conversations with parish nurses and volunteers and all of those other people in the community that support um, hospice services. And we just wanted to make sure that we were giving everybody the same tools to have these conversations. Um, some of the lessons that we learned was that we um, need to try a different and new approach. That, like Sue said earlier, that if we, we do the same thing, we're going to get the same results. And so we wanted to try something new and different. We wanted to empower our community and our um, physicians to be able to have the conversation and to have the questions they need to ask. Because sometimes just knowing how to approach the conversation um, is a huge barrier for people. So by empowering them, we were able to make a difference in those numbers. We also wanted to be able to be a resource. So if our providers needed um, more tools or if they had questions, they felt like they could reach out to us and, and we could be a resource as agencies to these providers and also to their patients on how to get these conversations started. And we did as an organization set the conversation as kind of a priority because we learned from, from all the conversations we were having that that was where the first barrier happened, that because people were not having the conversation, they weren't moving forward in the process. And so by giving them these tools that we've laid out, we were able to help initiate that conversation, which then in the end um, kind of influenced our numbers in this region. Okay, so now we'll talk a little bit about the results so far. The hospice programs in this project, all seven of them, collected data and submitted it to Stratus Health. Uh, so we have some baseline data and then monthly during the project and actually six months after the project, they continue to send data to us. Uh, the slide you, you see here shows a comparison of a baseline period of January through October of 2013, which is baseline, that's the light blue, and then the dark blue would be the remeasurement period after the interventions took place. And really the interventions didn't start till probably March of 2014. So as you can see, there was an increase in discharges from 236 uh, the previous year to 292, number of referrals. Oh, can you clarify on discharges too, Janelle? I think that's confusing unless you're really working in the hospice realm. Discharge also means discharge by death. Right. So, yeah. 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 So death. And that would be the majority of the discharge right. in the hospice. And then the number of admissions that were actually admitted in, into the hospice program. Then the next slide looks, looks at the length of stay. So we have the mean length of stay increasing from 39.5 to 44.2, and then the median is 13.5 to 15. And so as you can see, these three communities had an even lower uh, length of stay than the national average. So the resources that are available for uh, anyone to use are these. There's the Ask Your Doctor brochures, and that's the, the brochure that Terry described and listed the questions. Uh, they were designed to be very simple. They're at a fifth grade reading level. We had input from the physicians in the community, uh, patients, staff at the hospice program, community people, because we wanted it to be something that would be understandable to everyone and intentionally did not include the word hospice um, very often. 
And then the wallet cards are just the questions. So the idea was that a person could stick that in their purse or their wallet and pull it out and ask the doctor the questions when they went to the appointment. The two physician resources are for physicians to help them have the talk. Uh, most physicians do not have good experience in either practice or training on how to have these conversations, and we hear from doctors that they, many of them really don't even like to do them because it's uncomfortable. They take care of patients for years, and then it's really hard to have these conversations, especially with the time that they're given for appointments. Uh, we have PowerPoint presentations that are on the website, and that will be on a slide coming up here shortly. But they are for, uh, there's one for professionals, uh, such as physicians and healthcare professionals, and then there's one for lay persons as well. They include the speaker notes. So they talk about what are the, the barriers to hospice, talk about the myths, and then a little bit about the tools. We've developed a frequently asked questions which are common questions that people ask about hospice, so that's available. Uh, the community conversation guide, so if another community wanted to see, well, what do people in our community think about hospice? You know, what do they think are the barriers, or would they use hospice? You could use these same guides to talk to your providers or patients or just community lay folks. And then the last one listed here is called True Conversations Layperson's Guide. We wanted to get the questions and the discussion happening much farther upstream. So these are real simple guides for a layperson to have discussions with their peers. So for example, people have used it in their Bible study group or with their book club or there's been um, a home health aide that did with, you know, had the conversations with her, her friends. Uh, we've had a hairstylist that has had conversations with some of her customers. So it's just a tool to get that conversation out earlier. This is a picture of um, the website. So all these tools that we've talked about are on the public domain and are downloadable if you're interested in, in using any of them. They're free to use. We've also added a nice video, which is of a young woman who lost her husband a couple of years ago, and she talks about how she just really needed hospice and nobody brought it up to her. And then there's also a physician that is speaking from the physician's point of view. So we'll open it up right now for questions. And it looks like we were a little quicker than we thought we were, so we have plenty of time for your questions. While we're waiting for questions now, I think um, some of us, and I'm sure through all this work, had experiences that helped us understand where people were at with hospice. And some of the things that surprised me is I had a physician ask if hospice comes to the house. So um, that's, I think, where we needed to start with the understanding coming from. He asked, do we visit people at home? And... I just assumed everyone knew that that's what we do. So we really tried to look at um, starting from from the understanding that even providers may not have any information or understanding of what hospice does. Um, so that was um, so that was kind of interesting. There was a question on here earlier, Janelle, about hospitalized patient. Um, can you scroll back to that or no? Okay. So the, the question was about if a hospitalized patient chooses um, to to n not or chooses to go on hospice and not have aggressive treatment anymore, that they were told by hospice that that patient cannot be placed in an inpatient acute hospice in a hospital. So um, hospice has levels of care, and the first level of care is a routine level of care that we care for patients wherever they call home, and then there's a continuous care opportunity if a patient's symptoms can't be managed. Hospice can provide continuous care during that crisis period of time. There's also respite care. If there's a problem with the caregiver, the caregiver is called away and isn't able to care for that patient, they can be in respite for up to five days at a time. And then there is an acute inpatient um, level of care that patients can be placed in the hospital, whether it be in the acute setting or in a hospice setting, that they need to have 
the a symptom that couldn't be managed unless they were in that setting. And so that's kind of the the um, the differentiation there. There's I think hospice is not always a yes or no question. Oftentimes it's gray. We don't say yes, we always do this or no, we never do that. It, it's very based on what's what's going on with that patient and it's very patient um, dependent in terms of, of what what our plan will be at that time. So hopefully that answers your question. If not, um, certainly um, ask for some clarification on that. Is there other questions on the Yeah, you can open up the line please for questions. Thank you. We will now begin the question and answer session. If you have a question, please press star then one on your touchstone phone. If you wish to be removed from the queue, please press the pound sign or the hash key. If you are using a speakerphone, you may need to pick up the handset first before pressing the numbers. Once again, if you have a question, please press star then one on your touchstone phone. And we have a question from Cheryl Ferguson. Please go ahead. Hi, um, we're wondering if, like, the changes in Medicare requirements for admission has affected referrals and our ability to get in there, kind of starting admissions as soon as we would like. The criteria seems like it's gotten more strict in the last year or so. You know, I think we as hospices have to look at that criteria very closely and make sure that we're following the regulations of Medicare. I don't think it has impacted our referrals. But maybe we have to look very closely at is that patient appropriate for referral at the time that they're referred. Sometimes what we'll do is watch that patient for a while, maybe two weeks, maybe a month, if they are not really seeming to meet the criteria for hospice. But we've tried to stress with our providers that it's up to our hospice, our medical director, to determine if they meet the criteria, and they should refer if they think that it's an appropriate time for that patient. And then we just get back to that physician and say, you know, they're not quite ready yet. We'll watch them and see what's going to happen with them. So that we actually, we actually get direct us to by actually disease process, you know, when, mm -hmm. when it would be considered probably their last, six months of we're getting, you know, nobody can predict that for sure, but there's a lot of things that, you know, by what somebody's clinical status is, what their, you know, functional status has become, or you know, if somebody is not eating well anymore, you know, there's a lot of different things. Sometimes people can be quite healthy, actually, and mm -hmm. still have a six-month prognosis. I think maybe what you could be hearing, too, is that some of the diagnosis that we used to be able to admit with for hospice have been taken away, um, mostly because they're ill defined and we cannot say yes. One of, one of those is like failure to thrive is kind of a really vague thing out there. So I mean, there's a lot of people that fail to thrive, but we can't pinpoint that that they would meet that criteria of not being with us in six months. So the hospital, or Medicare doesn't like anything that that can't be pinned down a little closer. Other questions or comments? Once again, if you have a question, please press star then one and your touchstone phone. We have a question from Julia Sullivan. Please go ahead. Um, my question would be is um, when we have a, a patient that we're seeing um, start to decline, and they've hit the 100-year um, mark, and the doctor, the only thing that he can diagnose is failure to thrive. What have you guys seen um, to be able to help um, clients such as, you know, at that age, since failure to thrive is no longer one of the diagnoses that they can use? What I recommend to people is let's look at their other diagnosis and then pinpoint, pin that doctor down to say, which one of their diagnosis that the real diagnosis is most likely causing their failure to thrive and then and then um, look at that and see, you know, what, what kind of symptoms they're having and whatnot. It's certainly gotten more difficult. I don't know if Medicare was trying to necessarily not have patients on hospice as long because of changing the diagnosis. 
they just wanted to have us be more specific. Like Terry said, we have used things such as anorexia as a diagnosis or um, having to be a little bit more creative and really looking at what is causing their decline and their failing. Um, and I think Medicare is also I challenge us to use more than one diagnosis. Sometimes it is all of the diagnoses together. So what is all of it combined? Anorexia, some dementia. Maybe they don't need on the dementia scale, but we use anorexia, dementia as a secondary, um, those types of things. So you, we've had to get a lot more creative, I'd say. You know, the, the other thing that we don't always think about is, you know, when somebody has cancer as a diagnosis, that's pretty cut and dry. They've made a choice to not take chemotherapy anymore, so now they're appropriate for hospice if they get into that six months. So with other diagnoses, it's a little bit blurrier, but, you know, why would it be any different for someone with CHF that, that relies on his medications to keep him living? Those are treatments, and, and he certainly has the right to choose not to take his treatments either. And part of the statement for eligibility is without further treatment, it is suspected that this disease will take their life within six months or less. So. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Our next question comes from Myra Waite. Please go ahead. I have a question. As he was back in my nursing career, I remember something about that a caregiver had to be available. Is that still a requirement? Well, we probably all deal with that a little bit differently. The Medicare benefit is set up that um, there, it, there is a requirement for a 24-hour caregiver. But it doesn't really mean we can't admit that patient if they live alone. At least for us, what we do... Yeah, we'll, we'll admit that patient. We have patients that are living independently and living pretty well, but we always have a plan. So what will be the plan when they need that 24-hour caregiver? And we make sure that there's a plan in place for that to happen, whether that be going into a facility, paying for caregivers. Maybe they have family that has said they will come. Any of those scenarios work for us. Um, so we don't want to deny service to patients that could be getting our services while they're still living alone and doing pretty well. Um, so that's kind of how we've gone around it. It looks like you guys are both agreeing we've that you do the number. Of, we've got a number of patients yeah. that actually lived well and actually did better, of course, for a while while hospice yeah. got involved and helped them for a while and stayed alone for quite a long time until they got to the point where they weren't safe to be home yeah. alone or or weren't alert enough to make decisions yeah. about dosing themselves with medication. Right. So this is a big part of what we look at, and we tell them all the way along, and our social worker works really hard with our patients to make sure they know, and what we say is nobody can just stay at home until the end of their life. Somebody has to be caring for them at some point. But all along the way, while they're still independent, should be cognitively safe to be at home. And physically, for the most part, we can be bringing our staff in in varying levels to help them with bathing and whatnot. So that helps keep them home at longer. Can I answer your question? Yes, thank you. I just remember that being an issue when I did a lot of home health. <laughs> then we have a question from Stephanie Olson. Please go ahead. I'm actually the physician that's um, sitting with Stephanie. Uh, just a clarification, uh, we've had some struggles with patients that come into the hospital that are in, uh, have a disease process that's not fixable, and we have difficulty obtaining an inpatient hospital consult because of whatever Medicare ruling. So is, is that... Is that across the board that, that we are unable to have inpatient hospice consults because of Medicare, or is it specific because of state? I would say it's specific because of agency, maybe, because our, for, I can only speak for ours, but everybody um, has to follow the same CMS guidelines as far as the rules for participation of the hospice agency, but we all, each agency staffs differently and has different policies. Personally, our policy is that we do consults for free, so we don't really care what setting we're doing the consult in. Uh -huh. we, like, we, let, we need to admit them in the place where they're going to be receiving the services as part of our rules. So, again, you can't go for a consult, but where I would say most hospices would do consults. 
I think it's a huge, important part of the start of care is having that conversation at the hospital so that they can be prepared for what is going to happen when that patient is discharged and what's going to happen at home. Lots of planning happens at that stage, lots of talking to family about what their responsibilities are going to be. That's an important piece that we provide. What med staff are going to need to have set up right. home before they even get there and you know, really important for them to know, like Sue said, what this is all going to involve long before they ever get home and go, oh, my gosh, what did we get ourselves into? Yeah, I would, I would question the hospice that you work with on that. Okay, perfect. So you do admit them then to your service prior to them going home? You cannot admit until they're in their home setting. But you can do the consult, get everything arranged, and then see them at their home. And then Absolutely. Perfect. Thank you. Appreciate your discussion. Okay. Very helpful. And the consult is, for us, is free regardless of where we see the right. patient and family. Once again, if you have a question, please press star and 1 on your touchtone phone. And we have a question from Catherine Campbell. Please go ahead. Could you give an example of what would be... Uh, uh, hospice approved inpatient acute uh, care situation that you've that you've dealt with. Certainly, yeah. And, you know, we we as a rural hospice, we don't put a lot of patients in the, in the hospital because we feel like we can keep them comfortable really well at home. But um, I think if there's a patient that we can't get comfortable at home without being in the hospital setting, one example might I think was a patient who had. Um, a lot of bleeding in his bladder, and we could not keep the catheter draining. And in a home setting, there's only so many resources you have for that, and that patient was put in the hospital for that reason. Um, another and but you really have to document that unless they were in that acute inpatient setting, we couldn't get them comfortable. You know, another example that I can think of is sometimes those patients who are very agitated. And um, that can be extremely difficult to manage in the setting that they're in. So that might be something that if we want to look at maybe conscious sedation, if that, they're at that point, that can sometimes be hard to do in the setting they're in as well. That might be another reason we put them in patients. Well, we, we have a lot of tools in our arsenal, we like to say. We yeah. have them all, and, and doctors give us a lot of autonomy because they know we know what we're doing out there in the home. Um, sometimes that we may have someone who we cannot get regulated the right amount of medicine it takes to get pain controlled, and you're also dealing with non-professional care providers that are a little bit iffy about if they should give more meds or if they should hold it if they got too sleepy and pretty soon they're doing kind of a yo-yo thing with their medication and we can't really get our hands on it and the patient's having a lot of severe pain so we can bring them in. What that does for them is it has a 24-hour nursing staff who's right there watching the response to the medication. They can get an IV in if they need to get that dose adjusted to what is actually needed by that patient and then either get them back onto orals or send them home on IVs because we can do anything they can do in the hospital with IVs at home as well. But sometimes it takes that someone looking around the clock 24 hours and then having the doctor, you know, tell them to keep adjusting the dose until they get it to the right point. So that would be good. I, I have a follow-up question, which is, have you had any uh, situations, can you give examples, where the patient has been admitted into hospice and the the patient or the family changes their mind? Hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Let yeah. me tell them that right from the start, that this is not a sentence, it's a choice, and you know, if there's a miracle cure that comes up or for some reason they feel it's not for them or they choose to do something different, they always have the right to decline. It's called revocation. They, they actually sign something that says I'm revoking hospice. And all it really does is it changes them from the Medicare benefit of hospice back to their regular Medicare if they're a Medicare person. And those, the difference with that is that when you sign up for hospice, Medicare um, covers anything that's related to the hospice under their 
under their hospice Medicare benefit, they can still use the rest of their Medicare for other things, but when they revoke it, just reverts them back to straight Medicare then. I think it was terms of exams. That is one example I can think of that has come up um, certainly more than a few times is patients who are um, receiving chemotherapy for their cancer and have gotten very ill from just even the side effects of the chemo, even more so than ill from their disease. And once we have them on hospice, we, we um, get their symptoms under control, they do better, they may decide they're well enough then to get sign off and go back on chemo, and that certainly happens at times. That actually is a good thing to mention, that, that whole thing with the Medicare benefit, too, and, and the choices is kind of a, one of those gaps in getting people on hospice, because mm-hmm. some people really believe that, you know, the myth that if you sign up for hospice, you lose all your Medicare benefits, which, you know, as I just explained it, it is not true. You know, and the other thing some people believe is that you only get six months, so we don't want to start too soon because we might run out, you know. So... Mm-hmm. Okay. Does that answer the question that you had? Yeah, thank you. Okay, yeah. Our next question comes from John Fritz. Please go ahead. Uh, yes, a, a quick comment and then uh, a question. Uh, you know, getting back to the general inpatient level of care, another thing that, that we're seeing a lot is the use of proportionate failure sedation, and that's a lot easier to do sometimes in a hospital setting. Uh, because we're, we're challenged with our staffing and trying to get continuous home care uh, and yet keeping our staffing as lean as possible. Uh, now the question, looks like you've had some good results from your program in terms of increasing referrals and, and you at least had some increase in, in mean and median length of stay. What do you see as uh, going to be needed to maintain uh, that gain? Um, you know, so now, now you've had this project, you've done the conversations, what do you, what do you plan to do on an ongoing basis? Well, we're, from one agency's perspective, we are also home care, and we've found that we're using that brochure all the time with home care families and, and pretty much anybody else that we come in contact to that's, you know, saying, oh, I, you know, mom could really use some of that care, but she won't do it, <laughs> you know. And so right away we whip out the brochures. I think that's a big part is keeping it on hand, getting used to educating your staff to keep them on hand and using them. But that's a huge challenge, nonetheless. Mm-hmm. Any, yeah. any project, and you can probably speak to that too, Janelle. You know, we, we started out thinking we would train some volunteers to keep it going. That's been hard to get going and keep going. So that will be an ongoing challenge for sure. And um, you hope that people come to an understanding and that keeps moving forward, but it's going to take ongoing education. You can't educate providers one time and expect that's going to be good and you're good to go, but um, it's going to take ongoing work for sure. And I will add that in each of these three communities, we have provider education um, presented by a physician to all the clinics in each of the three communities. And I think that that was a real positive um, a positive thing for the physicians. For one thing, we didn't want to blindside them with patients coming in with these questions and these wallet cards and brochures, and also to help them understand some of the myths. We had real good response from the physicians in all those trainings. One physician said he actually learned something. So, there. <laughs> So our time is up today. We would just like to say thank you to everybody that participated on the call and listening to our story about this project that we're very excited about. And if you're interested in any of the tools, you have the slide for the website. So thanks again, everybody, and have a great rest of the day. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This concludes today's conference. Thank you for participating. You may now disconnect.